Run! Run! The moon is falling! OMG, we're all going to die! Or are we? Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, the show that at one time fostered thoughtful intellectual debate in the comments, and now, well, Google+. Plus. In less depressing news, let's talk about death by Moonfall. In Majora's Mask, you're constantly working against the clock to prevent this from crashing towards Earth, killing everyone and everything. Or re-killing them, I suppose. It's a long story we covered in the last episode. Anyway, Link, who may or may not already be dead, is rushing around like Bill Murray on Groundhog's Day to stop this thing from falling. The question I pose is this. Is he wasting his time? Now, I don't mean are his attempts to stop this glowing piece of radical rock futile, but rather, does this moon falling into this planet necessarily mean insta-death? One hit kill, game over. Seems like it should be a no-brainer, right? Giant space rock hurtling towards planet equals death. But I can tell you right now, the biggest threat to Link toilet hand in this Wiggles reject isn't a falling hunk of space rock, but we'll get there. Episode go. First, we need to figure out what sort of damage this falling moon would actually cause. To figure that out, we need to know how much energy it generates. To do that, we need to know how large it is and how fast it travels. But to figure that out, we need a sense of scale. So a lot of questions to answer here, and the first one, a sense of scale, is, as any loyal theorist knows, always one of my favorite subjects to address on this show. But this time, I've got it covered. Hyrule Historia tells us that Ganondorf is 230 centimeters, or about 7 foot 6 inches tall. By comparing character models and double checking against scenes with Link and Ganondorf together, we're able to calculate that young Link is about 4 foot 2 inches tall. But if you're skeptical about the book and character comparisons, another fun way to figure this out is to go diving. In Dr. Mizumi's lab in Ocarina of Time, there's a diving pool with meter marks. Using the iron boots, you can sink yourself to the bottom and literally measure yourself. Adult Link, at full height, is about a meter and a half, or five feet. Pretty darn short, but remember, it's not about size, it's about how you use it. Now compare Adult Link's height to Young Link's height, and again, you get just over four feet tall. Which is pretty cool, because now we officially know the heights of two Nintendo mascots, Samus and Link. I wonder if we can use that information at some point to calculate all their heights. Accurately, of course. Wario, I'm looking at you. Knowing this, we need to find a way to compare Link's size to the moon, meaning we need a screenshot that has the camera position to capture both Link and the full width of the moon from a relatively neutral angle. The widest cinematic shots of the moon also include the outer wall of Clock Town, and if you look, those markings can serve as a guide. Young Link is just at the height of that lowest dot. That gives us our comparison. So, when I took this into Photoshop, the moon was 150 grid marks across, and the space up to that first dot was 3 grid marks tall, meaning that the moon is 150 divided by 3, or 50 times Link's height. Since we know Link is 4 foot 2 inches, or 1.27 meters, we know the moon is about 208 feet, or 63.5 meters wide. So it's cool to know the numbers, but just to put that in perspective, our moon is nearly 55,000 times larger with a diameter of 3,474 kilometers. So Majora's moon is really just a little baby moon. Little moon in training. Good night, moon. Moon Junior. Junior Mints. Moon over Miami. Moon. Ah, uh, moon. There is, there's a joke here, and I, I can't figure it out. I got nothing. But while knowing its diameter is all well and good, we need its mass to calculate the damage it'll cause. And that means we need to know its volume first. So to avoid it getting too 
two mathy, we'll run through this part quickly. Volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, meaning Majora's moon is 134,000 cubic meters. And we'll just have to assume that the moon is the same density as our moon, which is 3,346 kilograms of mass per cubic meter. Fun fact, our moon is actually the second densest in the solar system next to Jupiter's moon Io. The more you know. Anyway, since mass equals density times volume, Majora's moon is about 450 million kilograms. Sounds like a lot, right? That's about the same as 75 Great Pyramids. Definitely massive, but nowhere close to our moon. In fact, our moon is 1.6 quadrillion times more massive than Majora's moon. Take that, creepy face. Not so scary now, huh? So Majora's moon might not be that massive. But remember, it's not about how big you are, it's how you use it. Maybe this thing is packing a ton of destructive energy. To know that, we need to figure out how fast it's falling. Think about energy this way. Consider a bowling alley. If you're having difficulty knocking down pins, there's two solutions. One, throw a heavier ball at the same speed, or two, throw the same ball, same mass, at a faster speed. Both of those are doing something to increase your overall destructive kinetic energy. So in this case, Termina might not have a massive moon, but maybe it's traveling fast enough to increase its destructive potential. So we need to figure out the speed of its fall. By watching from Termina Field on the final day, I was able to calculate that the moon falls 27 Photoshop grid marks during the world's last five hours. Since this was from a different camera angle, I had to recalibrate my numbers, meaning that the moon traveled 27 feet or 8 meters. This means the moon in Termina time is traveling 1.6 meters per hour or a whopping 0.001 miles per hour. That's 30 times slower than a snail. Ho <laughs> ho scary. But it gets even more underwhelming when you look at the energy it's producing. Kinetic energy equals one half mass times velocity squared, knowing that the mass is 450 meters million times 0 0.004 meters per second. Just so you know, I had to convert that 1.6 meters per hour into a more standard format to work in the formula. That equals an astounding 36 joules of energy. 36. Now, you might be asking yourself, what does that equal? Well, wait for it. In the second you just waited, your body released twice that amount of energy in the form of heat. One joule is what it takes to lift an apple. An apple up one meter. So basically you're lifting 36 apples. According to a paper published by the University of Leicester, it would take 2.25 times 10 to the 32nd joules of energy to destroy a planet like Earth. With such a low amount of energy, this terrifying moon crashing into Termina would actually be stopped by Clocktown's clock tower if it could handle that weight. But if that wasn't ironic enough, there's more. None of it matters. By the time Link starts his three-day journey to save Termina, it would already be too late. Whether or not the moon is powerful enough to destroy Termina, Hyrule, or the Earth for that matter, most people would be dead long before it happened. Here's why. Moving a moon, any moon, closer to a planet will increase the gravitational pull that moon exerts onto that planet. And with that comes some pretty extreme consequences. You see, first and foremost, the moon's gravity is responsible for the tides. So if it were slightly closer, the tidal bulge would grow. Low tides would be lower and high tides would be higher, meaning that any low-lying coastlines would be flooded. If the moon got much closer, say 20 times, closer, it would exert a gravitational force 400 times greater than what we're used to. A mighty tidal bulge would be created, hitting the land and causing tremendous flooding with cities disappearing underwater. In other words, the land of Termina would be more Wind Waker and less Majora. Someone call the King of Red Lions over from the adult timeline. But if the rising tides don't take you, the irreparable shifting of planetary orbits will. You see, as the moon gets closer to the 
planet and the gravity exerted from one body to the next gets stronger and stronger, the delicate balance between the Earth, or whatever planet Hyrule and Termina exist on, and their respective moon gets thrown off more and more. This in turn results in its orbit changing, and with a changing orbit, the climate of the planet also will see a shift. Wild fluctuations in weather occur, with changes in gravity and with weather and with climate that also means we're going to see more natural disasters, increased earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes. The list can go on and on. It's like a giant astral game of dominoes that hinges on an incredibly fine balance of gravitational pull, despite us talking at the level of planets here. When you look at it this way, it's incredible that some perfect natural balance was found on Earth for us to be able to survive and live here. One little shift in a gravitational equation here or there, and we wouldn't be here today to talk about the hypothetical effects of a hypothetical moon crashing into a hypothetical world. To sum up, the largest threat that this moon poses to Termina isn't it crashing into the Earth like an asteroid. Between the shifting waters, the fluctuating gravity, the destabilized rotation in orbit, the altering climates, and intense weather conditions, Link would be lucky to survive long enough to see the moon touch down. With Termina's moon hanging so low in the sky that early in the game, in a realistic portrayal, the damage would already be done. No amount of repeating the same three days would change that. But hey, it's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the Super Amazing End Card Tournament, where over the last few episodes, I was successfully able to convince you that Mario is a monster, and most of you want to get your Zora on to take your chance with Princess Ruto, post seven year jump I hope. This week I'm asking you something simple. What game series do you want to see me tackle in upcoming episodes? Here are some options. Classics like Mega Man and Kirby. Modern FPS games like Call of Duty and Battlefield. They're all the rage with the youngsters nowadays. PC games like Half-Life and StarCraft. Or something else. Let me know by clicking. Let me know by leaving a comment if you can stomach Google+. And I'll put it on the schedule. So thanks for the support, guys. Ultimately, this show is for you. So if if there's anything I can do to make it better, like choosing better topics, let me know. Alright, that's all I got. Matt Pat out.